Um, let me explain the candles up here. This is all you really need to know. I like candles. I do. But um, this is the, the last day of our official lighting of the lights for Christmas. We've left the lights up outside and we've left the, the battery-operated candles on the stage and some other bits of decoration, the poinsettias. And, uh, and I brought the candles out because tonight we're going to blow out the candles. And there's a little bit of a debate. I, I got I, I to gotta admit it. There's a little bit of a disagreement in the office. Now, we love each other and we get along most of the time. And uh, no, we get along well. But some people said, why don't we just leave the arch lights up? Because those look so cool. And Disneyland puts all the twinkle lights on all the time. But we don't know if that's going to happen. But we're going we're gonna to blow out the candles tonight. And we're going to sing a few bits of a few Christmas carols tonight as well. Anybody okay with that, singing some Christmas in January? And you won't believe how beautifully uh, closing up our, our, Chris, our official Christmas celebration, but don't you let go of it. Don't stop celebrating the fact that he came for you. How the, all that ties into even what we're talking about tonight. And, and I think you're going to see that. But tonight, we are in Genesis chapter 34. And uh, how many of you read ahead? Did any of you read ahead in, in, in Genesis chapter 34? I hope you did. And keep reading in 35 and 36 and keep, keep going ahead of us. But I, I gave it this message uh, title tonight, Don't Mess With This Family. This is Jacob's family. And you know about Jacob, and you're about to know at least about a couple of his sons, and uh, you're going to understand the the title of the, of the message, if you don't already, by the time we get through tonight, don't mess with this family. Now, last week, when uh, we were in this, uh, the, the passage before, it was, it was one of the most beautiful scenes in Scripture. And I mentioned that when we were moving through that. One of my favorite passages where two brothers reunite. And they, they both had reason to believe that as they were coming from different directions, the battle was back on and that Esau would, would uh, rise up to be true to his promise to dispatch his younger brother, uh, Jacob. But you saw, you saw the story. It didn't happen that way. It was the, the reunion of battling brothers. And I love that scene where tears were shed, real tears. So they wept. And they kissed one another. And, and the past was forgiven. And it was so surprising to Jacob to realize that his scoundrelliness, that is a word, I just made it up, but his scoundrelliness um, was forgiven, that his, his brother was, was ready to overlook that. It's like the New Testament passage that said, love covers a multitude of sins. Esau had a case against his brother to take him to court and to take him down. He'd robbed him of the things that were so precious to him. But they, the tears were shed, the past was forgiven, and they both moved on. But they moved on in different directions, and I'll say more about that in just a second with a tiny bit of review. But this week, it, it's not one of the most beautiful scenes in Scripture. It's one of the ugliest that you'll read. You'll read through that, and maybe you read through that and said, I can't wait to get there on Wednesday night and have Pastor Bill tell me why. God let something like that happen. And that question comes up more often than it ever has before. But it's one of the ugliest scenes in Scripture. It's the beginning of a possible war as boundaries are violated and moral boundaries are violated. And it's a scene of just unleashed lust and unleashed anger. And, and that takes over. And as you've read through, you've seen abuse and assault and deceit and rape and rage and murder. And there were tears shed in the previous chapter. Well, there's tears shed in this one too, but there's a lot of bloodshed in this chapter. And vengeance is poured out. And it's really poured out in an overkill way. If you want to look back and just jot these down or just note them in, in the previous chapter. In Genesis 33, after the, the embrace of, of Jacob and Esau, I love Esau's heart. And he just says to his brother, come on, let's move on together. And you would think that Jacob would say, of course we're going to move on together. I haven't seen you in how many years, 20 years, and let's hang out. But Jacob has a plan. 
And, and Jacob says, no, bro, you go on. And that's in verse 13, very dramatically how he pours it out and he pours on the my Lord, my Lord, my Lord to his brother. And he says, no, bro, you go on. I'll meet you in Seir. And, uh, and then now let me show you where Seir is, if this will cooperate. Right there. Um, Seir is way, way south. And where they've met is far north of there. But um, Esau heads down to Seir where evidently he was, he was camped. And he had gone far away from his, his parents by that time. But, but Jacob says, no, you go on and I'm, I'm, I'll meet you there. I'll meet you there in Seir. You'll see me in Seir. And uh, that never happens. And, um, and Jacob moves on and he moves to Sukkot right there. And he builds a farm there. The Bible says he bought some property, he built a house, and he built the outbuildings and the booths. He built booths for his family. He built booths for the, the animals. So he's, he set up a little farming operation. So no, there's no question, he's there for a little bit of time. We don't know how long. But he's there for a little while. And then he eventually will go across to Shechem. And, um, and that's where the, the story that unfolds here happens. But while he's there... He moves across the Jordan into Shechem. Now, at Sukkoth, he was pro somewhere close to 125 miles north of his brother. When he moves across the, the river into Shechem, now he's about 150 miles away from his brother. And you never see him making any trips on holidays to go see, you know, brother Esau and let the kids play with one another. It just doesn't happen. He goes to Shechem. And in verse 18 of chapter 33, when he moves across the Jordan, which always seems to be, in a, in a metaphor way, a very significant move. When you go across the Jordan, you're going into a new land. And it wouldn't look very promising for a while, but he's going into the land that has been promised, and you know the truth. He is surrounded by all kinds of other city-states and nations and entities that have claimed every square foot of what they would call the promised land or what we would call Israel today. So he moves over there, and Jacob buys more property, and he buys the property we saw in the last chapter from Hamor's children. Note that. That's the beginning of trouble. He moves into this, this agreement, this almost like a business type. It is a business transaction when he bought it, but he stayed there. And that's where the trouble really began. But while he's there, he builds an altar to Yahweh. It's called El Elohe. Do you see that at the very end of the chapter? And, and you'll note maybe it's in the margin of your Bible. El Elohe. El means God. And El at the beginning of Elohe means God again. And it's God. The God of what? God of Israel. The God of this people. Now, it's not much of a people yet. But it is a good-sized tribe for one man. He's become very wealthy, and he's got a lot of stuff as well. But he builds that altar, and he's being watched. Who's he being watched by? Hamor and his kids. They're watching him build his, his, his altar. It's an altar of witness as he calls upon not Hamor's gods, whatever they might be, but upon his God who's been faithful to Abraham, his grandpa, faithful to Isaac, his daddy, and faithful to him and his family and, and brought him back into the land. So he builds his altar, and it's a beautiful witness. But the children of Hamor, like I said, they're watching these new people that are in their land and have bought some of their property. It might have been property that they had their eyes set on. I'm gonna, when, when I move out of the house, I'm going to build my farm over there. But now, now Jacob's got it, and he's building his, his tribe. And, and uh, so one of them especially is watching Jacob's children. In fact, he's especially watching one of Jacob's children, a young lady by the name of what? What's her name? Someone's in the kitchen with Dinah. He's watching Dinah, and that's where we find ourselves. We're going to read the whole chapter. You okay with that? I'm going to read the whole chapter because as a story, and again, it's a rough story. It's a really, really rough story. But as I read through the, the chapter, I want you to notice, just take notice of certain words that you see repeated, certain words, and you, you don't need to keep a hash mark on it, but, but I'm going to ask you, it's going to be a quiz time as soon as I'm done reading, what words did you notice as I read, and maybe even names, I'll give you that hint as well. But here we go, verse 1 of chapter 34, and now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, 
whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated her. That should accurately read, though the King James and the New King James were a little, little bit more discreet in their wording, he raped her. He took her and raped her. His soul was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young woman, if you call that love. And he spoke kindly to the young woman. And so Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, Get me this young woman as a wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. And now his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. And I have no idea how he did that when he knew what had happened to his little girl. He held his peace until they came. And then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field and when they heard it. And the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter. Read with me. A thing which ought not to be done anywhere, not just in Israel, not just in, in that region. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter, obviously. Please give her to him as a wife and make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters to yourself. So you shall dwell with us and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it and acquire possessions for yourselves in it. Now, now, now that's, his, that, that's his story to Jacob. But wait a few verses and wait till you hear his version of it when he talks to his sons. There's an awful lot of deceit going on in this transaction here. And then it says, verse 11, Then Shechem said to her father and to her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes. Is that not audacious? Let me find favor? Me, the man that raped your daughter? Hey, be nice to me. Whew. Shechem said to her father, Let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me ever so much dowry and gift, and I will give according to what you say to me, but give me the young woman as a wife. But the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor, his father, and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. So dad's there, and he should be in charge of the transaction, but boy number two and three are going to be very, very vocal in this whole thing. They've got a plan, but all the sons of Jacob speak up and and spoke deceitfully because of what had happened. And they said to them, now here's the boys of Jacob, say, well, you know, maybe we can cut this deal, pun intended, pun intended. Maybe we can cut this deal with you, but you're going to have to do some cutting too. Verse 14, they said, we cannot do this thing to give our daughter to you who is uncircumcised, for that would be a reproach to us. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant. And they have been told expressly, don't marry outside of the covenant. Here's the condition, verse 15. But on this condition, we will consent to you if you will become as we are. If every male of you is circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you and we will take your daughters to us and we will dwell with you and we will become one people. But if you will not heed us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we're gone. Now, you don't have to imagine too far. There's, there's a difference between circumc circumcision as an infant and circumcision as an adult. Man, a big, big difference. And the difference is the degree of the pain. Now, I'm not saying a little baby doesn't feel pain in circumcision. Of course it does. But as a grown man that has to move around and do the, the chores of the day, you, you see it all set up. Okay, we'll, we'll agree with you. We'll, we'll give our daughters and we'll be one. And verse 18, and the words pleased Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. And what are they thinking? Hey, big deal, of course. Okay, we'll do that. And so the young man did not delay to do the thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. And he was more honorable. Oh, my goodness. I just can't believe the word honorable is put upon Shechem. Can you? He was more honorable than all the household of his father. Well, if he's honorable, I, I can't imagine what the rest of the jerks were, if that's how he acted. And these men 
Uh, I'm sorry, but up in uh, verse 20. And Hamor and Shechem, his son, came to the gate of their city and spoke with the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Now listen to his side of the story. Therefore, let them dwell in the land and trade with it, or trade in it. For indeed, the land is large enough for them. And let us take their daughters to us as wives. And let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men consent to dwell with us to be one people. If every male, every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. Now, can you imagine the men that are sitting in the gate at this point that don't know anything about this up to this point? Uh, how big did their eyes get when they said, look, all we've got to do. And so this is the only condition that we have to become as them in terms of circumcision. Will not. And listen to this. This is what's in his heart. Oh, what a deal he thinks he's getting. He said, will not their livestock and their property and every animal of theirs be ours? Oh, he's ready to take over. He wants to dominate in the land like he already does. Only let us consent to them and they'll dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate of his city heeded Hamor, who was the king. He was the, he was the big chief there. They heeded Hamor and Shechem his son. Every male was circumcised. All who went out of the gate of his city. Now it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain that two of the sons of Jacob, here they are, number two and number three, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. And they killed Hamor and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword. And they took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. And the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their daughter had been defiled. And they took their sheep, their oxen, their donkeys, what was in the city and what was in the field. You, you remember the story of Esther? You remember when, uh, who, who is the bad guy in the story of Esther? Somebody knows? Yeah, Haman. And Haman, Hamor, that really sounds similar, doesn't it? And they had this plan to do away with the Jews. And what happened to Haman? He died on the gallows that he had built. What did Hamor say? We're going to have all their stuff. What happens? Well, Jacob has all their stuff. I'm not saying the way they went about it was, was right, and certainly it wasn't right. But they took everything that was in the field, verse 29, and all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, they took captive, and they plundered even all that was in the houses. And then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land. In other words, there's more than Hivites there. There's all these other people, and now they've, this, this, this news is going to travel really fast, what they did to Hamor and his tribe and his little fiefdom, his little kingdom, that they took them down. and said, they're all going to hate me among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me, and I shall be destroyed, my household and I. But they said, and here's the boys, but they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? End of the chapter. What did you notice? What, what words kept coming up there? Anybody? What's that? Defiled? Defiled? Huge word in there. Vengeance? Vengeance? What else? What names, what names did you hear? Of course, Jacob, Dinah. Who else? Say, say it loud. Shechem? Levi? His brother, Simeon, all the brothers. Did you notice any name missing or any title missing in the whole chapter? No God. God is never mentioned. Jacob, who had built an altar at the end of the last chapter, when he comes into this thing, you don't see him running to the altar. You don't even hear him praying, God, what should I do? What should I do? God's not even mentioned in here. And there's no prayer. There's no calling on God. It's just men doing what men do all the way through. It's, it's very, very similar to the era that Joy is, is leading the ladies through in their, their study on the book of Ruth, the time of the judges. And the description of that time, every epic, every era in human history has a, a, one little sound bite that basically you could say the roaring 20s were like this. The dark ages were like this. 
The time of the judges were a time when everyone, did, did, say it with me if you know it, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They followed the dictates of their own heart, ignored what God had to say, and that is always going to be a mess. And if you meet a family like that, don't mess with that family. If they do what's right in their own eyes, it is always going to be a wreck. Keep that in mind when you read through stuff like this because it, it explains the whole thing. Now, I want to walk through the sections of this, and it, it really won't take long because, like I said, the story has really taught itself. But in, in verse 1, just all by itself, verse 1, all eyes are on Dinah. We heard about Dinah's birth earlier. The one girl that shows up, now probably Jacob, he might, he might have had more children, but Dinah's the, I mean, more, more daughters, more sons, but, but we, probably not more sons, maybe more daughters. But this is the only daughter we know anything about. And she was probably mentioned because as the story's being told, I got to introduce Dinah, and you got to know she was beloved by her brothers. You know, um, there's a, um, a differences of opinion on how old Dinah was at this point. I think the oldest that she could be is probably somewhere in her mid to late teens. But uh, one very, very respected uh, commentary by Kyle and DeLeach, the two last names of these uh, two, two uh, scholars, that said, by their estimation of looking at the, you know, the time elements through the book of Genesis, they believe that she was somewhere between 13 and 15 years old. And so there's Dinah. And she's, look at it again in verse, in verse 1. We're not going to necessarily read every verse again. But Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she, born, she had born to Jacob, she just went out to hang out with the girls in the land. She wanted to get to know her neighbors, right? And if she's 13, 15, 16, 17, 18, that's what you do at that age. I, I think our culture has, uh, has escalated independence quite a bit for sure. But she's just a young girl that wants to get to know the other young girls. And, and maybe they went out and they hung out together and they played together. And, and, and that's when Shechem saw her. In verses 1 through, just verse 1 all by himself is, is this. All eyes are on Donna, Dinah. And like I said, that one particular set of eyes where the horrible deed is done. In the next section of it from verse 2 to 4, we read about it. He saw her and he wanted her. And so he forced her. And he raped her. And that's always, always horrible. And, but the, the strange thing is, after he got what he wanted, it says he loved her. He wanted to marry her. Maybe that's where the honorable part comes in. I don't know. I just can't imagine putting a word like honorable on a man, a young man, like she Shechem. It sounds like Samson too, doesn't it? where he says to his parents, go get me that woman. I want that woman. I want that woman from that town. And now he comes to his daddy and he says, dad, you know, this is, you're in charge of, of marriages in your tribe. I want her. Would you get her for me? So the terrible deed is done and, and the word goes around of what had happened. And then in verses 5 to 24, when you see the, uh, the setup, as, they, as the, the heads of the tribes come together, Jacob and Hamor, and they're going to they're gonna talk this thing through. I am puzzled by the s seeming um, calmness in Jacob. Now, he's not happy about what happened, but I think I would have got my strongest sons and come with swords blazing to say, Can, do, are, you, are you telling me the truth? You your little jerk of a son? You let these boys run around and do whatever? And now you're coming to me asking me to sign an agreement that he can have my daughter to marry her? And the boys come in, and, and, and you read that, but it's Jacob's protégés that are just following their mentor. This last week, all of the, the pastors, and a, bunch, and, and a bunch of you too, we had about 27 that signed up for that mentoring um, conference. And that... Uh, that, that, the protege is the one who's being trained by the mentor, the student that's following the teacher, the disciple that's following the master. And the boys were learning how to deceive. I don't know where they learned it. I don't think dad sat down and said, now, boys, here's how you get what you want. Here's how you deceive your, your friends, your neighbors. Here's how you get the best of your enemies. But that's what they did. They stood there and they, they heard everything that, that I just read to you and and they're just doing what dad did. They're following dad's steps. 
Dad cheated Uncle Esau out of the birthright. He, he cheated him out of the, the, the riches of being the, the head of the, of the tribe. It should have been Esau's. And, and these boys are, are now just, they're kind of, they've got their own little game that they're playing. And they're reeling in this tribe that have their eyes on the beautiful women of their tribe, and especially this boy close to the chief who wants the princess from the tribe that now is camped among them, and the protégés are just doing what daddy taught them to do. We could stop here for a little bit. I don't want to take too long on it, but it's really one of the main side messages here. Fathers, mothers, how are you training your children? What are you training them to be? Because in spite of whatever I teach my kids, not that they'll catch it, not that I'll even teach, not that they'll even catch everything that I tell them, but they will be greatly impacted by what I, what, what I show them, what they see in me. And, and still that doesn't mean that they're always going to agree with me and walk the way that I walk. In some ways, I hope they don't walk the way that I walk. I hope they don't walk around sometimes grumbling and, you know, under the, the cloud and, and all that. But, but the, these boys have been learning from dad. And you and I have the greatest, greatest privilege of all. This came up in our mentoring class, and I'm still trying to sort this out myself. The, 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 the statement was made that you, you can be your children's parents, but you can't be your children's mentor. And I don't know that I completely agree with that. Because if mentoring is passing on skills and thoughts and, and abilities, I think you can to a degree. You can train, teach, help your children to, to live and to overcome and to thrive and to grow. And I want to do that. And I know that you do too. But it is always, isn't it a 24-7 job? How, how many of you love parenting? How many of you sometimes are tired in the midst of parenting? Anybody ever discouraged in the midst of parenting? Did they get it? Did they get, do they understand? Will they walk with me? But I love being a daddy. Uh, or as, as a couple of my kids call me, da. I love the Irish word for dad is da. I love, you know, being a papa. I love being uh, a grandpa. But it comes with responsibility. And the responsibility is to pour in the good stuff. And since you've got bad stuff in your life, all of mine is gone. Oh, there's only good left in me. That's all that there is. No, if you've been close enough to me, you know I'm still a, in a, a work in process. But to pour in the good stuff into that, and if there's bad, whatever it is, you can use that story as a warning to your children. I, I, was, I never held back from my kids at an appropriate age to let them know how badly I messed up as, as a kid, as a teenager. And even as, as a little kid, the stuff that surfaced when I was a teenager, I looked back and it was boiling in me as a little boy. I, I was, I uh, can't remember who I was riding with the other day, but we were talking about um, uh, schools and um, not capital punishment in schools, but corporal punishment. There's a, there is a big difference between the two. Um, but, you know, how many of you grew up at a time where parent, our teachers were allowed to spank you in school? How, now, let me see the hands of those that got spanked in school. Oh, I didn't expect that many. What a bunch of bad people. But I bet I got spanked more than all of you. And, and that would have been just in first grade because Miss France, I think she hated me. I don't know what it was about little Billy Welsh, but she found a reason at least once a week. You remember those, uh, those ping pong paddles that had a rubber band and a ball and you blap, 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 blap. Well, she took the, the rubber band and the ball. I'm not sure she took the staple off of it, but she took the rubber band and the ball off of it. And I got whacked every week as far as I can remember. It was pretty, I almost knew when to get up from my chair, when to just go up and, and let her do it. But, but um, what was I talking about? Yes. I have no idea where that was going, but um, what's that? Pour, I was talking about pouring into your children, and I'll see if it comes back. Yeah, and we were we were just talking about that thing of uh, back in those days when when uh, you, you know you got it at school too, but that doesn't happen anymore, which might be one of the reasons why there's so much trouble in the schools. But let's move right along. 
um, on to the, you know, what, what it really means to mentor your children is to teach them. And, I, and that's what I was talking about. I, I told my kids about all the trouble I got into even as a little boy in school. I see, that was an easy connection. None of you caught that. That's where I was going. Thank you. But um, you, you move on to verse 25 and 29 where the boys of Jacob, they're going to have their way now. Shechem had his way with their sister Dinah and they're going to have their way. They say, here's the deal. You, you want to marry into our family? You want to trade daughters back and forth? Well, it, it's only going to cost you a few days of pain All you got to do is come into our covenant because we can't marry outside of our covenant and they know exactly what's going to happen right after that deed is done. And so they come the third day and and these these protégés of their dad, they come raging into the camp and it's the aftermath of man's wrath. See, they're all mad. I'm sure that Jacob was mad too over what happened to his daughters. But his boys go running in. These two boys go into the camp and they wipe them all out because they're hurting too much to stand up and to walk around, let alone run around and defend themselves, and they just wipe them all out. The Bible says this, that the wrath of man never accomplishes the righteousness of God. It doesn't. This didn't have to happen. But these guys in their rage, the aftermath of their wrath is that everybody gets wiped out. Down in, in verse 20, I think it's verse 29, they have all their wealth and they take all of it. Verse 30 is what I was after. Verse 30, let's read that one more time. Listen to Jacob and let me emphasize a couple of words here. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious in among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And since I am few in number, they will deliver themselves, or they will gather themselves together against me and kill me, and I shall be destroyed, my household and I. Who's Jacob into? He's still all about himself. His favorite worship song is, It's all about me. It's all about him. Look at what you've done to me. Now, they had. There's no question that they had. Because the other people of the region would look around and say, that's how you control your boys. That's how you control your warriors. You let them run wild like that. And not even think about the story that was behind the wrath that was poured out upon them. What you see in verses um, 30 to the end of the chapter there, in verse 31, it's just the breakdown of the family. Again, it's just these these the father and the sons, the deep dysfunction between them, the fracturing of this chosen family. There's no question God has his hand on this family. But even in a chosen family like yours, even in a, a, a man, a woman, a young person that's, that's responded to the call of God on their life, as, as Isaac was talking to us before the service began, he said, come into this family. Come in under the shelter of the gospel. gospel. Isn't the gospel the most beautiful message in all the world? It says, repent. Oh, but that's hard. Really, is it that hard to let go of the poison and the garbage and the sin and the darkness? Well, yeah, we get addicted to it, don't we? We get addicted to what? The pleasure of it. We get addicted to, it's, you get addicted to the addiction of it. It's just there and it's like you, you automatically run to this or you run to that. But when you think of what you're trading off, there's no question, and I, I think it was uh, Leonard Ravenhill, uh, a, an evangelist of just a couple of, uh, I think he passed away a decade or a decade and a half ago, but powerful voice in evangelism around the world. He might have been the one that, that started this phrase. He said, the first word of the gospel is Repent. Turn from, repent and believe. Let go of your sin. Like, like Isaac was telling us, bring it to God for forgiveness. You don't just come running in to get the, the blessing of everlasting life without letting go of what has been leading you away from it. Repent means you just turn around and walk towards the light that is Jesus Christ. And it's all, it, it really is yours, but you're still going to be between now and the time you get home 
like I said about myself earlier, you're going to be a work in progress. <laughs> There's no question. There's going to be things that aren't right. Don't get settled into those things. Address them and identify them and list them before God. Lord, please go deeper in this area of my life. Like we sang, I think it was last week or a couple weeks ago. Do a deep work in my heart, Lord. Get me out beyond the shallows. Christian, don't stay in the shallows. Go deep in your relationship with Jesus. Spend time with him. But this fractured family, they'll, they'll, they'll come together. And, and these boys, yeah, they got more trouble coming, don't they? Yeah, the story of Joseph, yes, it's coming up as they sell them down the river. They, they're all, they've, everybody's got their dysfunction. Uh, Skip Heitzig uh, is listening to him on this, and, and I love what he called this chapter. This is dysfunction junction right here. And this is just a total dysfunctional family. You know why? Well, because Jacob was born to dysfunctional parents, known as sinners. And, and be, because Isaac was born into the same dysfunction that we all are born into. He carried the genes, the sinful genes, into the world as well. And I am just so amazed at the patience and the goodness, as we sang earlier, the grace of God toward all of us while we're becoming what he wants us to be. Amen? Well, just a, just a moment or two on this. Where did all this trouble start? Where did all of this come from? Well, yeah, it traces all the way back to the garden with Adam and Eve rebelling against God. But in the story here, here's this little 13 to 15-year-old girl just wants to go out and, and get to know the girls. She just wants to absorb into the culture. And that was a mistake, and I think it was a mistake for Jacob to not set boundaries that his children were to stay within. Please, please, get yourself to the, the, um, the seminar that's coming up with the cyber guy that's going to talk to us about these devices, not just for our kids, but for us ourselves too, the dangerous places that you can end up there. And, and, and Jacob, it's, it's just he wasn't setting the boundaries, or if he'd set them, he didn't, in, he didn't enforce them. I think there's another thread in here too. It's a business deal that bound Jacob to Hamor. They're living in very close proximity, and Hamor saying, hey, there's room for all of us, but from what Hamor says to Shechem and his, his other sons, he says, look, we can have all their stuff. I got a plan to bring them in. I got a plan to sweep over them and to dominate them. And there's a lusty boy, no question about it, that never learned to control his lust. And maybe that was his dad. Again, maybe he learned some of that from his father, and all of that leads to a life of just pain for more than just yourself. No, nobody in their sin just sins against himself. It spills over to the people around us. And then Hamor's evil plan to absorb them all. And that's why in, in the scripture, I want you to look up here on the screen, a couple of verses that go along with this. James 4 verse 1, let's read that. Where do wars come from? Do they, I should say, do they not? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your flesh? What's the answer to that question? Yes. <laughs> That's exactly where wars come from. Whether they're a war between me and you or whether they're a war between nations, it, it comes from a lust uh, for, for pleasure. And maybe that pleasure is I just want all that property. I want to annex Czechoslovakia again. I just got to have my mountains back in Czechoslovakia. And so Hitler and his lust for power and for more and for property. And we can go into story after story, but James hit it right. Jesus' little brother learned some wisdom. Wars come from our desires for pleasure that war in your flesh. And this whole thing was set up, I believe, partly because of that unholy alliance between Hamor and Jacob. That's why when Paul writes to his uh, Christian friends in Corinth, he says this, don't do that. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Let's read these, these questions together, these four questions. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with the devil or Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And the answer to every one of those questions is none. Now, now, now of course, you have interaction with people in the world. Paul will also say that to his friends all over the world and say, I'm not telling you to get out of the world. I'm not telling you not have any, any communication 
with your unsaved friends because he said then you would have to leave the world because unbelievers are everywhere and you're there to reach them. But he says you don't enter into those kind of agreements. Like what kind of agreements? Well, like a business agreement. I'm not talking about you selling something to somebody else, but partnerships between a believer and an unbeliever. There are some that have worked, and I even hesitate to say that because somebody might think, oh, well, then maybe mine will work. I got this guy who really wants to invest and no, he doesn't love Jesus, but maybe it would be okay. I can tell you there's, there's a mountain of stories that say don't do that against one or two where it seemed to work out because there was humility, a surprising humility on both sides. But marriages, don't marry outside of the family of God because you're going in two different directions. It talks about being unequally yoked together, and you've got to get that picture of what that means. It's two animals that are somehow harnessed together, and, and if they're pulling in the wrong direction, if they haven't learned to, to move in, in the same direction, it's, it's a nightmare to get them to move one way. And, and, and that's the picture that Paul meant to lay down. He said, here's the truth. If you join in marriage to an unbeliever, and if you have, that's where you are now, and you get to be a witness to that, that man or that woman. But if you join yourself to someone who's not following Jesus, they're following something. Maybe they're following their own desires, their own passions. And if you're yoked together with them, it's going to be pulling, pulling, pulling in two different directions. So wait, wait, wait for the right person. Well, the whole point of this, uh, this mess that we've seen here tonight, whatever the reason for this mess, we all know it didn't stop in Shechem because there's more messes coming, even with this chosen family, and we all have our messes too. N nobody's fault but mine, really. My, my biggest messes are nobody's fault but mine. I, I have dysfunctions just like you do. And you could, you could, certainly you could say with some families, they should have that, that sign on the, on the front gate, don't mess with this house. Don't mess with these folks. And you just kind of, you know, you make your way around them because you know a bad dog lives there or, a, or an owner that just wants to fight with everybody. Here's how this connects with this tonight, this table full of candles. And um, this last moment where we're going to sing some, Christmas carols. And you know what else we're going to do? We're going to light some candles, more candles. We're not going to do it in here. We're going to go out on the courtyard. And um, I, I looked for a couple of big bags of half-used candles from Christmas Eve because we don't throw those, those away. There's a little bit of scotch in all of us, I guess. Um, or Scottish, I should say. Not scotch, but Scottish in all of us. <laughs> we're going to go outside and we're going to sing these songs, but don't leave yet. I want to share a song with you that is, uh, it's off the, the Christmas record that I, I did. And there's a line in there that just so reminded me of this. Um, this is why Jesus came. Th this chapter that we've just looked at is why Jesus came. It's a picture pretty much of the world, isn't it? You talk about local dysfunction, political dysfunction, family dysfunction. Look around the world. Open up any newspaper, any newspaper, and see if you don't find 30 articles on bad news because, because the mess is everywhere, and this is why Jesus came. For broken people and lost people and abused people and dangerous people. I, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I know there's some of us in here who were dangerous people before Jesus got a hold of us. We weren't safe to be around. We would lose our temper or we'd steal from everybody that we could. I used to joke about that, that, um, you know, I, I, I really did. This is not a joke. I, I had a, a horrible habit of uh, kleptomania. Had to steal, always steal, always stealing something, even if it was just walking out of the convenience store and grabbing a pack of gum. And it was constant. In fact, I was looking in your cars on the way in and I saw some... <laughs> No, that's, that's the joke. That's the joke. But I wasn't safe to be around before I came to Jesus, and he's been working on all of that. So this is why Jesus came for every broken person in the world. That's one of the reasons I asked Alan and the staff, let's leave the lights up for all of January. 
And we were going to take them down after last weekend because last weekend was the last weekend of January. I said, no, leave them up until Wednesday night. And we're going to make something of this and do something together. But I'm going to share this song with you, and then we're going to walk outside together. And as you go out, there's, there's uh, ushers out there, and maybe the pastors are helping as well, to pass out these little candles, and we'll take the, maybe a couple of, if any of you want to carry, you know, you can't have these. You've got to leave these um, behind. But if you want to carry one of these out, you're more than welcome to do that. But I want to share this uh, song with you that was uh, a song I wrote while I was driving down the freeway one night thinking about the world that, uh, that Jesus came into and why he came here. And um, so I'll do this and then we'll go out. Do I have to start doing anything back here? Do I have to step on anything? If it has to be stepped on, um, oh, maybe it's back there. There it is. I'm not used to the wireless. This is kind of fun. Listen to the words. An endless line of headlights on Interstate 5 Three hundred miles before me on my midnight drive I can't help but think about those travelers long ago Who made their way from Nazareth to Bethlehem of old Oh, Joseph, rise up from me humble man had doubts along the way and maybe Mary's father had a word or two to say when he heard his daughter's story did he struggle to believe and you know it had to break his heart the day he saw her all in shambles in the year that he was born. But peace was just a memory and hope had all but died. But this baby broke the darkness of the moment that he cried. Oh, Joseph, hold him close to your side. And his son begins his journey in this world that he so loves. To bear our sin and sorrows, and to lift our heavy load, and to travel every mile with us on our midnight roads. Oh, oh, oh there are
He came to bear our sin and sorrow And to lift our heavy load And to travel every mile with us On our midnight road Father, I know that there are some in here tonight and some listening to this message tonight that are carrying heavy burdens, even some from the kind of things that we've read about tonight, Lord, where they've been wronged, deeply wronged, Lord. And I pray you would give the grace tonight, Lord, to lay the, um, the burden of vengeance down, to lay the, the burden of retribution down, Lord. To give them grace, Father God, that would move towards healing of their hearts. Lord, teach us a better way, uh, even with our enemies, God. Teach us a better way of casting all of our cares upon you and moving on to what you have for us. Thank you, Jesus, for the gospel. The great truth that our sins have been washed away by the blood and are free, Lord. We ask if we receive, we're free of all of that. We love you, Lord. And we thank you, Jesus, that you came. We thank you that you came wrapped in flesh as a baby, so vulnerable, such a target of abuse, that you took it for us. We thank you, Lord. Be with us now, Lord, as we move to the courtyard in uh, one last evening of celebration over your arrival and what it would mean for us in Jesus' name. Amen. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach with Pastor Bill Welsh. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.